Hello, my name is Reagan Reese with Roche Diagnostics and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for the Managing PCR Solutions Across the Continuum of Care for Respiratory Season webinar. Let's take a quick look at our agenda and then I wanna start with a few housekeeping items prior to introducing our presenters. Today, we will begin with a presentation and then we will have time for Q&A before we conclude. At this time, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen to locate the control panel. We will not be using the raise hand feature during this webinar as we are unable to take you off of mute. We ask that all questions be submitted through the Q&A button. To submit your question, simply click on the Q&A button, then type your question into the comment box and click send. You may have to click ask question if you are using a phone or a tablet. Your questions will only be sent to our Roche panelists, but you are welcome to send them anonymously. As I mentioned, we will do our best to address all questions before the end of this presentation. I would now like to turn it over to our moderator for today, Allison McMullen, Scientific Affairs Manager at Roche Diagnostics. Allison, over to you. Thank you so much, Reagan. Thank you so much, Reagan, and I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce our two experts today. Our first is Dr. Mabelli Cintron, who is the Assistant Director of the Microbiology Service and Associate Director of the CPEP Clinical Microbiology Fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And our second speaker today is Dr. Nam Tran, who is a Professor and Senior Director of Clinical Pathology at UC Davis Health. These two experts will share their experiences and knowledge on respiratory testing, and uh, at the end, we'll have questions. So Dr. Tran, we'll kick it over to you first. Great, thank you for everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. So I wanna start off with uh, really talking about uh, where we are at, what we have learned, and where are we gonna go with uh, COVID-19 and uh, respiratory testing? And that's us up there in Sacramento, um, uh, up north of, of northernmost institution amongst the University of California system in California. So next slide, please. So some quick disclosures. I am a consultant for Roche Diagnostics and Roche Molecular Systems. Uh, UC Davis is a designated Roche Diagnostic Center of Excellence. And um, I served on the California COVID-19 Testing Task Force uh, during the last uh, year, uh, two years or so. Uh, so I just wanna mention that this presentation does not necessarily represent the views of the state of California. Next slide. So we'll start here first. I picked August 3rd, 2020 um, for a reason. Uh, I think a lot of us early on in the pandemic, you know, around January, February 2020, we felt that this will be done and gone uh, probably by a couple months, maybe not summer, but by August 3rd, you can see here that most of the map from this Johns Hopkins website is quite red. And of course, uh, the virus um, accelerated quite rapidly. It definitely created um, situations, conditions that required us to think more innovatively. And of course, the numbers on the left right there uh, really show how, how big of this issue was. And of course, we don't have to really be reminded of that because we're still living in the, um, the, the pandemic or more so now endemic stage. And by then, we had over 4.6 4 million in the United States uh, being confirmed to have had COVID uh, with 18 uh, million plus across the world. So definitely something that highlighted the need for uh, a, ver a variety of testing capabilities that we all end up deploying. Next slide. We had to go through multiple surges. The original alpha variant followed by Delta, but of course in late 2021, and this is data from the US, Singapore, as well as the UK, uh, um, we ultimately uh, had Omicron show up. And Omicron uh, was unique in that it was highly infectious, but also broke through a variety of our uh, vaccination barriers. So uh, more individuals, healthcare workers became infected at our institution. We actually uh, started feeling, we were very lucky during the first phases to not have had too many employees be out to the point where we had to consider altering workflows. But for Omicron, we did. So uh, we had to deal with that through January, and then we had to deal with the second uh, Omicron wave uh, around um, close towards springtime. Next slide. So ultimately, COVID-19, personally for me, and someone who's an amateur uh, historian, uh, really was our Pearl Harbor moment as a profession. We really... Uh, fully appreciated the lack of infrastructure our country had in terms of public health testing. I think a lot of us in the public health, as well as infectious disease, microbiology space, appreciate 
appreciate that public health in general was not really well funded, uh, but it was definitely um, disappointing initially that uh, we could see that the infrastructure definitely could not keep up um, very early on. We came in quite overconfidently, um, and I'm just as guilty as many of you. Uh, we felt that our experience with the 2009 H1N1 swine flu and then Ebola um, um, made us feel that we could handle this next um, um, organism. Um, one of my first uh, career moments was Ebola. Actually, I was only two months on the job, and uh, we were proudly able to build a small Ebola testing lab, as well as prop up um, effectively isolation rooms to handle this biosafety level four organism. So how much worse could it be? That's what we thought, right? And of course, we were proven quite wrong. But uh, there is a silver lining. Uh, however, through this crisis, we have learned that a lot of our, our capabilities have been augmented. We see more significant investment in the laboratory space, especially with molecular infectious disease testing. And of course, same with public health. They definitely have been uh, more invested in, and we are now more able to address um, emerging threats as they come. Next slide. Uh, so here we are in California, just a uh, orient everyone across our 10 academic campuses. So University of California has 10 schools, however, five of which have medical schools and health centers. So UC Davis, that's us up north, uh, UC San Francisco, and that's really the two UC medical centers in Northern California. In Southern California, they're more well endowed with uh, medical, uh, medical schools. So the UCLA, UC Irvine, UC San Diego, and really UC Riverside and UC Merced are now growing their own medical programs too. But the core UC health facilities are the five Davis, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Irvine, and San Diego. Like many of you, we were monitoring the waves and we uh, interviewed at waves and we heard about the first reported case of COVID-19 in Wuhan, China in, in late 2019. And like many of you, we decided to up our inventory of respiratory um, panels. We have just like all these institutions have multiplex capabilities, but also point of care molecular platforms, 20-minute uh, PCR tests that we're able to uh, support uh, rapid testing in our clinics and the emergency department. So we expect it to increase uh, utilization because clinicians will want to rule out um, um, other bugs and perhaps then rule in uh, suspected cases of COVID-19. Next slide. Uh, we were still pretty assured through January, but we were kind of taken uh, back a little bit when Wuhan got locked down on January 23rd. But we were then happy to know that the CDC began shipping out um, kits, COVID-19 kits, to public health labs on February 6th. Uh, we knew that at least we can send it to public health down the street from us, right? We didn't have to send it all the way to Atlanta at the CDC lab. But not long after, we then heard about how those kits were um, defective. And then we really started talking more operationally about if we should deploy our own assay. Uh, up to that point, it was more purely academic. Uh, it was more so kind of like a fun exercise for our fellows, our residents, and perhaps some of our leadership. Uh, but, you know, well, we, we felt that, it, you know, the CDC and others would be ready. So with the CDC kit now being problematic, we did begin steps to bring up testing, um, thinking that, and wrongly thinking that, that we may not see a patient case for a while. That all changed on February 26th, and the first known community-acquired case in the United States happened to be at UC Davis. Uh, so that definitely put us on a war footing a lot more quickly perhaps than others. Next slide. And ultimately our overall strategy was quite simple. I think a lot of people now two and a half years later uh, felt that um, my planning for the uh, COVID-19 response was this elaborate scheme with multiple steps and strings. And really it comes down to three things. <clears throat> First step was bring up SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing as fast as possible. Uh, didn't matter how much we could do. At the time, uh, 20 or 40 tests a day was probably more than enough uh, for what we were seeing. Uh, no cost was too high, no sacrifice was too great. The leadership was extremely supportive of us. So we, we pretty much had everything uh, moving as fast as possible. And we brought up testing in a matter of, of a little bit over a week. Uh, after that, scale testing as high as possible, because now we started to see that, wow, we need to test more and, and they have means to test more just in case uh, and to meet the state testing gaps. And then once we have capacity, let's start looking at special populations. We need speed. Um, we, we saw plenty of places that can do hundreds of thousands of tests, reference labs, right? Or tens of thousands of tests. Uh, but we also have patients here at 
institution were the number one kidney transplant center at the time. Uh, and we need a test to make sure that someone didn't have COVID so they could receive their organ. So uh, we need a faster test at least, you know, less than an hour or an hour and a half. So you can see here from March through June, we deployed a variety of platforms, uh, original open plate PCR that could do 20 to 40 tests per day. And within about a week to two weeks, we had high throughput automated um, uh, COVID platforms. We added serology testing. We added a second high throughput system and then brought in uh, more so validated because we have the instrument already. We validated an hour and 20 minute uh, rapid COVID test that helped meet the need of those um, urgent cases. We brought in serology testing, refined serology testing to look at anti-spike IgG. And we even brought in a medium throughput uh, PCR platform in June because we realized sometimes there are situations where you can't fill up a 96 well plate. And if you try to fill it up, patients are waiting. So we need that medium throughput platform to deal with Mondays where there weren't that many patients in the morning. In November, we deployed and likewise expanded our point of care molecular platform. So a 20 minute test that could do both uh, SARS-CoV-2 and flu, and we expanded from 40 instruments to 56 instruments across our health system. So our ED took the brunt of the, uh, the testing, but uh, we still had instruments across the clinics. Next slide. Uh, so UC-wide, uh, you can see that we exponentially increased our testing capacity, and you can see the circles in the bottom left corner of the density of testing that we covered. And of course, Southern California with a higher population density experienced a lot more testing uh, in the, um, the region. Next slide, please. So what did we learn from, uh, from COVID? Well, we learned about the virus itself. The, I like to tell our trainees that I learned something new about the virus each week. Um, so we, of course, know from classic virology, in this case, the spike protein was responsible for viral invasion in host cells. But what was new to us was asymptomatic COVID-19 was possible. Uh, this was um, not appreciated early on for good reason. We were taught that if you had a respiratory virus, you probably are symptomatic and the, the asymptomatic part changed the game. Um, we also realized this virus did more than just cause a respiratory infection, right? We see that the nervous system, coagulation cascades, heart, heart lungs, kidneys were all affected. And now the emergence of long COVID, which we still have yet to have a full grasp on and increases risk for other complications. And we also appreciate that uh, subsequent strains of and uh, variants of COVID became let more infectious, but less attributed to severe disease, especially amongst vaccinated individuals. Next slide. We focused on molecular testing early on. That's what we were trained for. This was the accepted standards. In some cases, people call it the gold standard. And it detects uh, you know, the genetic uh, product of the virus, very sensitive and specific. Um, so we can detect early infection, low viral loads, and not susceptible as much to false positives. However, that sensitivity kind of hurts us because when a person is infected and need to be cleared to come back to work, some people stay positive for quite a long time. And this becomes a very challenging um, uh, situation. And likewise, it's a little bit more expensive and not always fast. Uh, usually same day results with a few exceptions. As we know, we have a 20 minute test available. Next slide. Uh, this leads us to antigen. Uh, sadly, antigen testing in 2020 was often uh, criticized uh, and not really uh, wanted, right? So uh, in some ways, manufacturers actually scaled back manufacturing in the United States uh, for that reason. And that cost us in 2021. Uh, it was cheaper than molecular methods. It could be performed at home. It could be mass produced, so it's scalable. And perhaps results, a negative result or positive result could relate to infection, infectivity. So are you infectious or not? Um, it is less sensitive compared to molecular. Um, I do bring up that we are probably comparing a little bit of apples and oranges here, but it, it is less sensitive. Uh, and for asymptomatic individuals, it requires uh, serial testing so they can catch that um, viral load at higher levels um, as time progresses. Next slide. Sequencing became a big operation. Um, public health labs performed it for surveillance. Uh, it helped us with contact tracing. We have cases at our institution where we were able to trace back um, a patient that infected employees, uh, and we were able to sequence and identify that. Uh, we were able to predict, um, you know, emergence of new variants. However, there was no real clinical value at the time. Uh, Delta, Omicron, good to know, but did it change our management? Not really. Uh, and it's very expensive. So many hospitals didn't use this for routine testing. Next slide. Uh, serology. Uh, serology was really exciting in early 2020. We all wanted to be serology positive so that we could not have to worry about being infected, but we quickly learned that 
most of us weren't infected before. Uh, and then we also realized that not all serology assays worked well. Those point of care tests were not great. And at the same time, um, some serology assays targeted anti-nucleocapsid -nucle protein antibodies, while others targeted anti-spike antibodies. Um, IgGs that are or against the receptor binding domain may perhaps better confer with immunity, um, while those with uh, antibodies against nucleoprotein are uh, perhaps more sensitive, but and perhaps correlate with immunity, uh, but they may not have that same um, amount of, of effect against um, um, spike. Uh, nucleocapsid, anti-nucleocapsid antibodies are useful in capturing or identifying individuals who were naive to COVID-19 infection, but were vaccinated. So if they were vaccinated, they'll have antibodies against spike, especially with those RNA vaccines. And then if they had an infection recently, a vaccine breakthrough, then perhaps the anti-nucleocapsid antibodies would be positive. And of course, we mostly prefer IgGs, but there are some IgM assays out there that may be useful for looking at early exposure. Next slide. So a quick evolution and summary of where we've, uh, where we've come from and where we're at today. Uh, next slide. We started with open plate PCR, and then you'll see the emergence of automated systems, sequencing, even early lateral flow antigen tests. Next slide. Rapid point of care PCR. Home testing, no less. I think there's a lot of people out there that were surprised. Now we have home molecular and, and, or, and LL. FA lateral flow assays for COVID testing. And then next slide. And then of course, um, I, 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 you know, I remiss to not uh, include, um, can you go back one slide, please? Um, uh, remiss to say that we also have high throughput antigen testing that exists in some platforms. We have one here at Davis and is used for return to work testing. Next slide. But we can't forget that, you know, it's not all about SARS-CoV-2. We will, we are expected to see a resurgence in influenza and RSV this year. Um, in Australia, the flu uh, flu season was a little bit more severe. Uh, in California, we have alerts going out from public health saying that we need to be ready for the rising RSV cases. In fact, I've heard even locally, uh, certain uh, uh, grade schools, half of the students were out because of, of some respiratory illness, likely RSV. So as we reopen, relax masking, and try to return back to norm, uh, these regular bugs come back, and they'll come back with a little bit of a vengeance, so we have to be ready for that. So with that said, I'm going to hand it off to our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Tran. And now we will uh, move over to Dr. Citron. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Tran, uh, for that wonderful uh, uh, talk on COVID um, and for also helping me transition into talking about other uh, respiratory viral infections. So I will be focusing is to respiratory testing as to who are we testing, what are we testing for, when do we test, and how. Next slide, please. Here are my financial disclosures. Next slide. So when it comes to um, respiratory testing, there are many factors that we have to consider when selecting the appropriate uh, diagnostic testing method. So for respiratory testing, um, we must take in consideration the time of the year, um, as we know that there are some respiratory viruses that have a predictable seasonality, which I'll discuss uh, later on. But um, we also have to take into account where the patient is actually located. Um, who are we catering? Is this the outpatient, outpatient setting or is this inpatient setting? Um, this actually has implications as to which line of testing you may actually be able to offer these patients. So when we talked about the tests themselves, we want to make sure that these have a reasonable uh, turnaround time, specifically for those viruses for which we have antiviral therapy, and that it's actually essential that you start that antiviral therapy within um, you know, 48 hours of symptom onset, such as in the case of influenza. Um, there's also the considerations on the diagnostic performance of the assays that you're using. So you wanna make sure that you test uh, that your test can actually detect the pathogen of interest. And we also have to consider um, the patient population. Um, are we testing a pediatric or an adult 
uh, patient population. Um, is your patient, are your patients immunocompromised? Are your patients immunocompetent? Um, and then least, uh, last but not least, there's the cost of the test. So this not only have you have to consider within the laboratory the cost that you're bring, of the test that you're bringing on, but also the cost for patients. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned, there is a predictable seasonality of respiratory viruses, although we know there's been some um, flexibility for some of these that have started to uh, show up when we least expected them. Um, I'm showing here on a schematic of the seasonality of respiratory virus infections in temperate regions. So, you know, with uh, during uh, the time of the year, there are seasonal factors like temperature and humidity that can actually influence a host airway immune response and affect also the viability and transmission of respiratory viruses. Um, and since we are in the fall and winter is coming, uh, now we'll actually see this peak in influenza and RSV infections. Um, so for which laboratories are starting to repair. Um, so for the purpose of the talk, I'll be mostly focusing on these two viruses and how we actually diagnose these. Next slide, please. So when you're selecting for diagnostic testing of respiratory illness, we have to take into account also the clinical presentation of your patient. Is your patient presenting with upper respiratory infection symptoms or are they actually presenting with what seems with, uh, to be a lower respiratory tract infection? Because this will actually impact with uh, which pathogen, right, you will have in your differential. So when we think about upper respiratory, we mostly think about respiratory viruses. But when we think about lower respiratory, there are viruses that can also uh, cause lower respiratory uh, illness. But um, there's also more bacterial pathogens that will be then considered. Um, so when it comes to diagnostic testing per se, so these are just uh, a general overview of the um, most uh, routine assays that we use in diagnostic laboratory. So we have isolation methods like culture, uh, which have been considered for a very long time, the gold standard in diagnostic testing. Um, we also have antigen-based methods. So we have the lateral flow assays, and these um, also now we have home, uh, at home tests, like Dr. Trem mentioned, that have become a hot topic during the COVID pandemic. Um, there's also immunofluorescent assays that are also uh, antigen test um, based methods that you can do directly on clinical specimens. And then, of course, there is the molecular testing, uh, which have become actually the preferred method of testing for respiratory viruses. And I'll go into the, uh, the, some of the pros and the cons of each of one of these uh, for us to understand really why that is. Um, next slide, please. So viral culture has been used as a reference method, as I mentioned before, for a very long time. And it's mostly because it allows the vis to easily observe um, um, the viral infection through the cytopathic effect, so or as we refer to as TPE. However, um, one of the issues with uh, viral culture is um, that it requires technical expertise, and the conventional uh, culture methods actually have a long turnaround time, which is not ideal. Um, you actually have issues uh, to consider with the sample integrity that might impact the sensitivity of being able to isolate um, your, um, your, viruses of, your virus of interest. Um, so for example, um, and there's also, sorry, the um, uh, viruses that are labile, like RSV, that culture is actually not the preferred method because of that, because we know that um, the virus may die uh, very easily and you may not be able to recover it um, through culture. There's also been, um, because of this low, um, low turnaround time, there's also been the development of the rapid culture methods like the shell vials that have actually been developed and used by many laboratories uh, as diagnostic testing for viral infections. And basically um, the, the concept is to um, <laughs> centrifuge uh, the sample with this shell vial that has a monolayer of, um, of cells and to by centrifugation you're actually enhancing infection and then using fluorescently labeled antibodies you can actually stain that monolayer and observe um, your viral uh, your virus of interest. Next slide please. 
So, like I mentioned, there's also immunofluorescent assays. These are um, antigen-based methods that can be done directly on specimens. Um, the convenience is that they're actually more rapid than your culture methods. They can take anywhere from one to four hours. However, the issue still is the technical expertise. These are hard, um, you know, these are actually quite sophisticated methods that you need instrumentation such as fluorescent microscopes and technical expertise in using this instrumentation to be able to um, to do this kind of testing. And of course, there's varied sensitivity and specificity. So depending, again, integrity of your specimen, but also the type of virus that you're looking for, you're gonna see uh, different uh, performances on these assays. Next slide, please. And then the antigen test that we keep uh, hearing about because of COVID testing, um, so for example, these are your lateral flow assays. So the convenience of these assays is that they're quite fast. Like you can obtain results within minutes. They're very easy to use to the point where we have at-home testing available. And they're actually cheap as well when you compare it to other uh, testing methods. However, there is variable sensitivity and specificity. It depends on the virus that you're uh, actually testing for, but it also depends a lot on the patient population as an example. Um, I have here the RSV and the flu antigen testing. So flu antigen testing is really um, known to be quite poor in when it comes to performance characteristics. Um, however, RSV is known to perform very well in pediatric patients, but not as well in adults. Next slide, please. And then last but not least, there's molecular testing. So. Molecular testing, some of the advantages is that it can actually provide results quite quickly. We're talking about hours rather than days. They're highly sensitive and highly specific. And at this point, we actually have shifted in our diagnostic um, 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 testing algorithms when we're thinking about viral infections. We've Laboratories have actually changed their practice to actually use uh, molecular testing um, for viral infection diagnostics. Um, and in part, one of the really, you know, um, pros about molecular testing is the ability to multiplex. So being able to detect multiple targets at the same time. However, you have to consider that these are um, more expensive than some of the routine testing that we do in the laboratory. And they also may have some complex result interpretation, mostly because um, you know, the ability to detect non-viable organism, although it's an advantage, it's also a disadvantage. Um, just like Dr. Tram um, mentioned too, like you may have patients that may be shedding also virus for a very long time and you may be able to detect uh, that virus through molecular testing, but in reality, symptoms have resolved and perhaps they're not even infectious at that point. Next slide, please. So it's very important that we choose wisely when it comes to testing for respiratory viruses. And I have actually adapted this table to include some of the common uh, respiratory viruses. Um, and I'm shown here uh, some of the methods for detection and identification of uh, these viruses. And as you can see on the red box here, I'm showing you that in category A, which is the test that is generally preferred for all of these viruses, uh, nucleic acid amplification methods are actually the preferred method. And yes, you do have for certain viruses um, the availability of antigen. However, like I mentioned before, there's considerations to uh, take into account, right? So like I said, for RSV, for example, we know that uh, antigen test is good in pediatric patients, but that's actually not the case in adults. Next slide, please. So here um, I'm going into a little bit into influenza testing, what's actually routinely uh, done um, and what's available, and then of course what's preferred. So we prefer sample to answer molecular testing um, because antigen testing is actually, the performance is not as great, um, but we also want these tests to be in a point of care device. It's, mo it's the most convenient uh, due to the rapid turnaround time that these assays have, because it's really important that we actually um, are able to quickly um, 
diagnose a patient who has influenza so that we can actually initiate antiviral therapy within the 48 hours that it's indicated that for us, um, for proper um, initiation of therapy. And here on this table, I'm showing you the different methods and the turnaround times. So in red, you'll see that for the rapid uh, influenza diagnostic testing, so antigen-based methods, uh, your rapid molecular assays, you can have anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes of turnaround time. However, when we are looking at the bottom two, which are the uh, virus isolation methods, you can see that these actually take days. So now we're sort of um, in, in, in a disadvantage when it comes to that, um, if we want to be able to give patients antiviral therapy. Next slide, please. And as I've been mentioning through these slides, so we have a respiratory, um, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV testing. So it is preferred that in infants and children, you can use molecular and antigen-based methods. But in adults, we actually prefer molecular. And I'm here uh, showing an example of a study that assessed um, 60 specimens from RSV, um, potential RSV infected adults. And they actually assess different um, antigen tests. So here we have the BD and the virus antigen tests. Um, in comparison, when you compare it to PCR, you can see that for the most part, the antigen tests were not able to detect um, the RSV infection in these patients. So overall, you know, we're talking about a 10 to 20 percent only um, accurate detection of RSV infected individuals. Next slide, please. So I've actually mentioned um, the, ab the ability of molecular testing in actually um, being able to multiplex, so detect multiple targets at the same time. So this have actually then led to the development of syndromic testing. And it's also important to understand in what kind of setting would, uh, should syndromic testing be considered then. Next slide, please. So when we look into the Infectious Diseases Society of America uh, guidelines, so IDSA recommendations, um, they actually mention that when we, um, we should consider syndromic testing when patients um, are significantly, significantly immunocompromised, when patients actually present with severe influenza-like illness, but also if, detect if detection of another virus uh, would actually influence the decision to prescribe antiviral or withhold antibiotics. And that's actually very important for antimicrobial stewardship purposes. Next slide, please. And here I've actually put together a table um, with examples of FCA clear assays for syndromic panel testing. So as you can see, um, these um, contain a wide variety of organisms that can be uh, detected. These include bacterial and viral targets. Um, there's different ways that these are actually um, set up. So these can be on demand or batched. Um, and the turnaround times can go to less, a little bit less than an hour, all the way to a few hours. Um, and at this point, um, most of these assays, if not all, have actually also incorporated uh, the detection of SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So there are benefits uh, to syndromic testing. They provide highly sensitive and specific results for a broad range of organisms. And these have actually uh, helped shed light into prevalence and clinical significance of many viruses. Um, but also it has revealed that co-infections are common. Um, another advantage uh, is the fact that you can actually detect subtypes. So for example, influenza A, you can determine if it's H1, H3, or H1-2009. Uh, um, but also they provide uh, results within uh, you know, a rapid turnaround time. So that's also very convenient. Next slide, please. So there's always the question then whether, you know, it's more actually better. Um, so as I mentioned, you're able to detect uh, multiple targets, but we also observe that um, in many occasions you get patients that have multiple of these targets being detected. And because these are qualitative results, you're actually 
sort of like wonder um, in the clinical um, side, like which target is actually being responsible for the patient illnesses? Is this actually a co-infection? Are we talking about, you know, like there's one particular uh, virus that is responsible for the symptoms um, or, um, and then there's this other virus that perhaps is just a past infection. Um, and this comes to then to the topic of, you know, we are dealing with a molecular test, so we are able to detect viable and unviable organisms. So it's really hard to say whether this is an active or past infection. However, I'm hoping that when we are drug using diagnostic testing, we're diagnosing a patient who is actively having symptoms, correct? Um, so there's also the question of utility as to like which patients are actually benefiting from this from this line of testing, um, because not every virus has a therapeutic agent available for treatment. So, like our not all targets have action, you know, are actionable. Um, however, you know, many of them do have infection control precautions um, that you need to put in place. Again, depending on the setting that you are in. Um, and then um, there's also, like I mentioned, the impact on antimicrobial stewardship. Are really are are patients really being de-escalated um, of antimicrobial therapy? when um, you're, you're um, resulting one of these panels and it's completely negative or there's a, a target that it's um, detected, then are, are people actually then um, de-escalating um, the use of uh, antimicrobial uh, therapy? Next slide. But then, like I mentioned in the beginning of the considerations, we have to take into, the account, to, into account the cost of the test. Um, when it comes to molecular, they tend to be a little bit uh, more expensive than um, other tests. I'm here uh, showing an actual example. So I'm just going to focus in three um, in the three red boxes. So if you were to test for influenza uh, using a CLIA waved assay with a rapid turnaround time, you may see that uh, these can be anywhere from $26 to $50. Um, or even $100, depending on the testing method. Um, and for this is the cost of the actual test itself, not the patient cost. Um, but then when you go into the moderate and high complexity assay, such as um, more of the um, molecular assays, including the syndromic testing, you can see here in the last table how there's more um, money signs. So these are way more expensive than the other tests. Next slide, please. But at the end of the day, I really wanna make sure that we really understand, right? Why molecular testing has become the gold standard. In fact, we often refer to it as the platinum, platinum standard when it comes to the diagnosis of viral infections. And it's mostly due because of its high sensitivity and specificity. Um, when it comes to syndromic testing, yes, it does allow clinicians to rapidly test for a broad range of organisms, and this may be specifically pretty useful in the in, in immunocompromised patients, for example. However, we have to take into the account that diagnostic stewardship is actually needed to properly implement these tests. And with that, um, I will think we will then proceed into the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Citron. Um, for everyone to remember, if you do have a question, there is the Q&A box at the bottom. Please feel free to type in your question and we'll try to get to them today. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Tran and Dr. Citron. Those were excellent, excellent presentations. Um, as always, still learning a lot. So I'm gonna throw my first question over to Dr. Tran because I love you know, to talk about our crystal balls because we always get asked our crystal ball and um, what do you think our upcoming respiratory season is going to look like and, and how are you preparing for it? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll preface, I've been wrong twice already last two and a half years, right? We, we felt that uh, the first, in 2020, it will be the twindemic as if I recall that, that's the news terminology for flu the or the fluvid uh, uh, pandemic, right? Uh, and of course, both uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, that did not necessarily pan out. Uh, I think this year will be, uh, we definitely have seen a rise in RSV. We've seen flu show up at odd times in May. I think we had a couple of cases start showing. So uh, I think 
the, 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 the organism is trying to figure out what to do too. So that's, that's, that's my guess. But uh, I think we will be uh, pretty busy this fall. Um, we definitely have um, restocked up our respiratory panels. Um, we also made sure that uh, our combined flu as well as COVID kits are uh, in decent supply, but also the education to go out too. I know there was a recent CMS uh, release, which was then retracted, that we can't use the combined flu and uh, COVID tests for asymptomatic testing, which I think they did see the light, uh, light of logic to kind of backtrack it because that was a little bit tough to execute for a lot of places. Uh, but with that said, we've, uh, we've decided to um, um, build our, our COVID-only tests for our, our point-of-care platforms. Uh, they've been validated for a year. Uh, we just, you know, just putting into the queue for IT and those will be ready to and give those options and educating a lot of clinicians on what to test for, right? So I think a lot of the bulk now is restocking supplies, making sure education is good and also making sure our testing algorithms and workflows remain robust. I and mean, that's been our main um, effort to uh, prepare for this fall. And Dr. Citron, I'm gonna ask you the same question. What are y'all doing to prepare for this upcoming season and, and what are y'all predicting? So given that it's New York and everybody's out and about, um, we're actually preparing, to, you know, for the worst in the sense that we do know that this may be uh, very um, uh, interesting respiratory season because now we don't, we're not really just worried about COVID, but we're worried about influenza, we're worried about RSV. We have also seen cases of influenza during the summer. Um, they were sporadic, but still concerning uh, because like I said, you know, we have these predictable seasonalities. However, um, this is sort of like a little bit confusing as to why are you showing up? Um, why are we, like, should we worry? Should we start then? Um, um, should laboratories then um, be prepared uh, to test for these viruses like sooner than expected? Um, so fingers crossed, but um, for sure, I think that 2022 will look more like past years, but also on top of that, you know, we have to think <laughs> about COVID and all the new variants and how we're actually going to then be able to um, offer testing in case there's, you know, a significant peak in um, positivity rates. Thank you. And um, you mentioned variants, and there's a lot right now in the news starting to come up about some newer variants. Um, there's been some discussion about this, and I think we've talked about it a little bit in the past, but how do um, laboratories assure that they're, the tests that they're offering are, are able to detect the variants? You know, how are manufacturers working with you guys to help this, and, and how do you educate your, your clinicians and, and patient, anybody that you're interacting with that our diagnostics are still good? Uh, Dr. Tran, I'll go to you first. Sure. Um... We, we educate folks. I mean, obviously, we keep an eye on the literature. We keep an eye on the sequencing efforts. A lot of academic institutions remain sequencing. Our, our main campus is continuing to sequence. Uh, but, you know, uh, we know that the assays that target the nucleoprotein gene, relatively robust, right? Uh, tests that target the open ring frame and e-gene, pretty robust, too. The spike region seems to be what tends to mutate more, uh, which can cause those dropouts. But again, many of those assays also have multiple targets anyway, so you'll still detect those reasonably well. Uh, well, I try to educate folks. We, we, you know, we've been through a couple of times with Delta and Omicron. People panic that is our test going to be able to pick it up. Yes, we targeted more than one gene. Um, not to say that the virus will be smarter than us and will come up with something new, uh, but that's why we also have means to, we hold on to the samples for quite a bit of time. Uh, we also, of course, remind physicians to look at the patient too. And if there is a suspected a sample, then we're happy to send it off to sequencing and send it off to public health to work it up because maybe there is something new, right? So I think we just have those layers upon layers that will catch something, hopefully. And I think that's fine. But the assays have become quite robust. Even tests that have dropouts, um, they've still been able to work. They actually have been helpful, to be honest, uh, to catch these uh, new variants. Great. And Dr. Citron, anything to add? Yeah, basically just the same, you know, like we keep an eye for those new variants. Um, we are an academic institution and we do in-house sequencing and this information, you know, helps us understand uh, the variants that are actually circling in, um, in our population, in our patient population. So that's really helpful. We have um, multiple testing platforms. And again, uh, we are always vigilant to see how these uh, platforms are performing, um, you know, in with the emergence of these new uh, strains. Um, so, and 
you know, the, the public health information, the sequencing, you know, companies doing their insulinical analysis to see how good their probes are at um, detecting these variants. It's really helpful, of course. So um, there's a lot of communication. I think COVID has actually has led to having, you know, this great um, interaction between companies and lab test um, laboratory, uh, you know, diagnostic laboratories and making sure that our tests are actually uh, reliable. And that's really, really important. So, um, you know, just to think about one of the good, you know, the great things about COVID. <laughs> um, so. It's definitely changed. I think I was um, in the lab before joining Roche in the very beginning of the pandemic. It's changed that interaction. I think laboratories are having with manufacturers, with their public health, with all these different groups. I think it's brought us all a lot closer. Um, so you mentioned having multiple platforms. So Dr. Citra, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, someone has asked this question. Do we now believe it's safe to standardize or consolidate to a single platform, much as we had had maybe pre-COVID um, as we're transitioning now into this endemic state? Or do you think we're going to maintain all these different testing methodologies? So that's actually a great question um, because, like I mentioned, you know, we have all these multiplex assays, some of which are very extensive. Um, so to be honest, it's hard to know whether it's safe or not. However, um, you know, it really does depend on your patient population. So when we're thinking about the inpatients, you know, you're worried about perhaps, um, viruses that may cause, you know, issues, outbreaks in your, in your hospital, and maybe there is no antiviral therapy, but, you know, within your patient population, the virus can have significant um, clinical implications, so you may want to be able to test for that. So I think re it really does depend on that aspect where I was uh, in the beginning of my talk talking about the setting. Are we talking about an outpatient setting or an inpatient setting? So perhaps in your outpatient setting, it would be safe if you're testing for flu, RSV, and COVID. Um, but when you're talking about in a hospital setting, perhaps you do want to, uh, you know, uh, test for a few other uh, respiratory pathogens, uh, especially, you know, in our institution, we, we are a cancer center. So for us, every target matters because we know that not only flu, not only COVID and not only RSV can cause severe disease in our patients. Um, so I think, again, it, it really does depend on your patient population and this, you know, and the setting. And Dr. Tran, do you, how do you feel about consolidation of, of these assays, especially if we're talking about like platforms that are doing the exact same thing? Yeah, so we've been lucky. So in total, the platforms we've eventually grew to is a very, probably about seven platforms platforms, two of which we didn't deploy the full panel. So the, those two platforms were effectively our multiplex platform. So we either use it for our, our COVID only and suppress all the other results because that, that was kind of from a supply chain issue. Uh, but since uh, since then, over the past year, we've actually consolidated down to just two platforms for COVID testing, the rapid ultra fast point of care, which really is doing the bulk of the testing these days. And we have those two high throughput uh, systems that will do the uh, more of the outpatient testing. But I agree with Dr. Cintron that that the multiplex testing is very useful. We have a comprehensive cancer center here too. So patients who are going to be admitted at risk, they can get the multiplex panel. Our outpatient um, testing for multiplex respiratory panel is a little bit more limited, um, but they also have access to a, a flu RSV kit on their rapid point of care molecular platform if they choose to. And of course, rising RSV rates will support that. But we have consolidated down to uh, two COVID platforms now uh, and retain our existing multiplex testing platform. So we've been pretty happy with that. The supply chain issues were less of a concern, uh, but also it helps with um, staff uh, competency. Uh, we just had our cap inspection I and mean, passed very successfully. Uh, but, you know, the it's, it's competency, staffing, and just supply chains, you know, kind of thinking about that too. Definitely a challenging time, I think, as we're going into it. And I, I like that you're talking about, you know, RSV, because there's a lot now in the news about rising RSV rates. I was in Indianapolis uh, just a few weeks ago in the hospital. The children's hospital was completely overrun with, with children with RSV being hospitalized and seeing severe cases. Um, so I think people have been kind of living in this world of, like, COVID only, and now we're looking at, like, these tri three flu COVID, flu COVID RSV. 
Um, and you mentioned this a little bit, but are y'all really providing like guidance now from the laboratory perspective to the clinicians um, in the different settings of like maybe what's the best test to order? Um, or is it very open? I know inpatient, outpatient, but how are y'all working through that with your clinicians? We try to keep, I mean, we, we actually maintain mostly the same education before COVID, right? So like, you know, as you mentioned, you know, if you're an ED patient coming in, you know, our ED physicians aren't going to wait for the hour and a half uh, multiplex testing, right? But if they're going to be considered for admission, yeah, they're, they're going to, they, they, they can uh, get that testing. It's also tied in with our procalcitonin too. So we've been pretty successful at running procalcitonin because, uh, you know, it's been uh, shown to have good data for lower respiratory tract infections. So I think that's been coupled together with multiple other modalities, uh, but we still kept it pretty simple. Yeah. Outpatient, highly discouraged from multiplex testing, unless you are at risk, uh, um, you're an at-risk patient and you compromise and whatnot, but also consider they have a rapid test available for them already. Um, but we kept it pretty simple. Uh, and mainly because it's the challenges for the outpatients too, for us, some of the payer bases may not be um, uh, compatible with the, the, the expense of those tests. Those tests are great, uh, but you know the insurance side and so forth has not necessarily caught up yet. Yeah, for us, we're sort of like in this um, unique setting where we only offer syndromic testing when it comes to respiratory disease. Um, so we don't offer uh, right now limited, um, you know, like less, um, what's uh, like those limited panels. So we used to do for employees, for example, for monitoring, we used to do the flu RSV only test. Um, we actually are not currently offering that. Uh, <clears throat> But yeah, our patients, everybody gets a syndromic test. I mean, we really can't risk it. Um, so for us, you know, when they're presenting with symptoms, they're usually, we don't have a, an urgent care, we have a urgent, urgent care um, center. And when they present, they'll swap them. And then for those, we are we actually prioritize, but these all go into the, um, our rapid syndromic test. Um, so, but our point of care, we don't do any rapid testing we of infectious diseases in general. So we are a centralized lab for all of our, um, for all of our clinics. Um, so, but all we offer is actually syndromic testing. But again, it's very unique. <laughs> um, our patients are, you know, are in quite critical state. So we want to make sure that we offer them the best of the best. <laughs> I think it's great how many options we have and how it can be really tailored to different patient populations. It's a it's a good place, I think, for us to be at. So talk about a little bit of a different testing modality, at-home testing. Um, this is kind of the new thing that came out of the COVID um, pandemic. And Dr. Tran, you mentioned um, antigen testing, and y'all both kind of talked about some of the pluses and minuses of antigen testing. Um, how your your thoughts and feelings on moving respiratory testing out of the laboratory space into the home space, what maybe are the pluses and minuses there? Is it, and can we expand that beyond COVID antigen, uh, maybe to also like flu or RSV? And is there room for PCR in that space too? It's a big question. Sorry, Dr. Tran. I, I, I think it's exciting. I, I, I say it with some a little bit of caution. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I was a point of care guy uh, early days, by one of the fathers of point of care testing. So I think it's great uh, you know, that it exploded uh, from a good standpoint because it creates access to care, right? And so for us at UC Davis, we recognize very quickly migrant workers. Um, they needed access to care. They couldn't come to our hospital for our fancy PCR test, right? So we were able to deploy mobile clinics with antigen testing to just get them access to care. To ca and they're the high-risk population too. Um, now, with that said, also wearing the CLIA hat and also the operational hat, uh, as we saw with the early COVID serology tests that were not as well regulated, right? Um, there are many different kinds, many different flavors. There's no real standardization yet. And we still have not fully vetted or understood the uh, relationship of antigen positive or antigen negative and PCR positive results yet. I think there's a lot of uh, assumptions we're making. I think they're exciting assumptions about infectivity, but no one's really told me that, you know, that's the definitive viral load that's going to uh, perhaps transmit. I think there is an opportunity to expand to other diseases, even STD testing, honestly, um, but it has to be done so in a pragmatic but uh, regulated um, step, and we're going to learn a lot, I think. Uh, there could be opportunities with, you know, mobile testing too and and you know even with uh informatics and whatnot being linked in because you know home testing isn't easily tracked 
that's the other thing we have to figure out too. Dr. Citron, do you have any thoughts on the at-home space? So, you know, it's really convenient. And when it came to COVID, we're dealing with like this whole issue, right? A pandemic, we want to be able to test everybody, but we really didn't have the capability in the laboratory to do that, right? And to provide fast enough results. So it was actually very convenient and useful for this. However, you know, you it's funny because um, in my experience, um, like I knew friends that were not following the instructions. So you have to worry about the sampling itself, right? Are people actually doing, you know, the self-collected swab correctly? Like I had a friend who decided to swab his throat. I'm like, that's not the indicated, you know, like sample type, hey, it was positive. We know that, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be detected, you know, in the, <laughs> in the throat, but it's just not what it's supposed to do. But, you know, the thought of people just putting a swab up their nose, um, you know, and kind of like scratching the back of your nose, it's just not... Uh, something that everybody is able to do or understand exactly what they're supposed to do. And I think, you know, um, some assays were pretty good with the actual instructions. Others were actually a little bit more confusing. Like I used multiple ones and I was like, okay, this is not really as, as a straightforward. Like I'm a lab director and I was literally going back to the package and so I'm like, wait, did I do this right? Like, is this going to affect my my you know my uh my test results so i was like very you know it, it it's it's exciting but for sure um we have to there's so many considerations to take you know even with regulated testing we know that for the most part you tell clinicians to collect a certain sample type and sometimes that's not what you get so um yeah Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Tran and Dr. Citron for um, all your wonderful information you've shared with us today and answering many questions with uh, for us today. And we really appreciate this. And we look forward to, I guess we look forward to seeing what this respiratory season is going to hold for us, but at least we have a lot of testing options. And, and I think this year we should be much safer with supply chain and all of that. So it should hopefully be something we can all get through. And now I will throw it over to Reagan to close this out. Thank you guys. All right, thank you again for your time, and we hope you enjoyed this experience. As we conclude, you'll be presented with a brief survey about this webinar. Please stay on the line for a few minutes as we value your feedback and appreciate your participation. Have a great afternoon.